And this is Cami Peterson with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. We're going to get started. Thank you again to everyone for joining us today for our hot, cool, clean, clean heating and cooling opportunities for Massachusetts municipalities webinar. Really excited to be sharing with you information from our new white paper, from a lot of expert speakers. So without further ado, um, let's get started today. And we will be moving on to our next slide, if I can figure out how to use the clicker. Oh, thank you, or just have one of my colleagues do it. Um, so our agenda here today is um, to talk to you about that white paper, some of our findings about clean heating and cooling opportunities for our cities and towns here in Massachusetts. We have a lot of expert speakers here. We'll have time for a little bit of discussion and Q&A at the end. We're really looking, both with our white paper and this webinar, to enhance clean heating and cooling awareness around the Commonwealth, with a particular focus on public facilities. So we'll be introducing some of those clean heating and cooling technologies, Massachusetts policies. We'll be highlighting pathways for local governments to utilize, and we'll be featuring case studies brought to you by these speakers of local facilities that have benefited from clean heating and cooling technology. So really glad, again, that you're joining us here today for this. A little bit about us, for those who might not be familiar, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. We're the regional planning agency for Greater Boston. We serve the 101 cities and towns that you see here on this map. That takes up about half the state's population, about two-thirds of the state's jobs, and as you can see, over three million residents in the dense and diverse area of Greater Boston. I mentioned to you my name, but I did not let you know that I am the director of our Clean Energy Department, and here's a little bit about that department here. We work on a multitude of different clean energy and climate mitigation and resiliency plans, projects, and policies. You can see that we like to work regionally, not a surprise, as a regional planning agency. We've helped a lot of cities and towns with their clean energy technologies. We also like to work on planning with our cities and towns one-on-one, -on -one, as well as collectively help support through technical assistance, help plug communities into grant and other financing possibilities, work through permitting and zoning and policy issues at the state and local level. We've done a lot of work lately, and you'll hear a little bit more about this in the coming slides, on net zero and getting our cities and towns to net zero through planning, guidance, education, and technical assistance. We are doing a lot of this work. I mean, the, the impetus for our work as a department much of our work here as an agency and the net zero work that we're doing, which has led to this clean heating and cooling work, is the urgency of now. Some of you have heard us talk about this before, and we're obviously not the first or the last to do so. But no one really needs reminded, but it's always good to kind of frame our work in the, the urgency that's happening around both the, the Commonwealth, the country as a whole, and the world. So many of you might have heard already that 2018 was the fourth hottest year on record. The other hottest years are all within the last several years as well. And sobering news again that just this past August was re reported that July was the hottest month ever recorded on Earth. So obviously this is an issue, a challenge, a crisis that is not going away and is getting worse by the minute. And we're doing what we can here at the local level and at the state level to, to approach and attack and tackle that problem. Cities and towns are taking the lead, too. We're really excited by the work that's being done in our cities and towns, as well as around the country and the world. And this slide is really to highlight not only some local leaders here, but also how some cities and towns, even in states that you might not expect to be at the head of this movement, are really taking charge. And the pioneers across the country, especially with the federal advocation on climate change, have been our cities and towns. They're working toward 100% renewable energy, getting to net zero, finding and setting really appropriate and ambitious clean energy goals and putting forward the strategies and the actions to get there. We're looking to support those clean energy transitions in every way that we can. So with our Zero to 101 initiative, which is the net zero approach that we launched about two years ago, actually nearly exactly two years ago, in September of 2017, um, we've been working hard with our cities and towns to help them set those net zero goals put forward the plans and the strategies to get there and deploy the actions and the technologies that are needed to, to reach those goals. We look to do that through planning, through collective purchasing and procurement, and through policy. So our latest white paper and, and research product that we're excited to share with you today is really focusing on the clean heating and cooling opportunities for Massachusetts municipalities. And the reason is because of all the, the kind of 
unlocked opportunities that exist in that thermal sector and what a big chunk of our emissions it is. So here's the link. We'll talk about it a bunch more times today. Um, you can find it on our website and we'll be sure that you can get a copy of it or access it online if you haven't already. So one last piece before I turn it over to my colleague Brooks here to talk to you about the details of our findings and our, on our white paper and the webinar for today is again the why to clean heating and cooling. I touched on this a moment ago, but you can see here through these pie charts what a substantial chunk thermal energy makes up of our total energy consumption here in Massachusetts. So the Department of Energy Resources recent plan, the Massachusetts Comprehensive Energy Plan, really put this into perspective. As you can see, the thermal chunk of that, that pie chart to the right is only smaller than transportation. It's 39 percent, and that's also over 30 percent of our statewide emissions generally comes from the heating and cooling. Our fuel use is made up of nearly all fossil fuels, natural gas and fuel oil, imported energy set sources that not only are more expensive, obviously much dirtier and worse for our environment, but are also coming outside of Massachusetts, so aren't supporting the local jobs here. There are so many reasons why for our climate goals and many others we should support clean heating and cooling, and we're excited to share more of those and the opportunities to take advantage of the clean heating and cooling sector with you today. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Brooks Winner. Great, thank you, Tammy. Um, I'm Brooks Winter, a clean energy specialist here at MAPC, and I'm just gonna take us through some of the highlights of our new white paper, and then I'll turn it over to our uh, panelists who are gonna present a, a case study uh, from the white paper, and then talk about some of the resources that are available for municipalities that are, are investigating clean en energy, uh, clean heating, cooling systems in their facilities. And then um, we're gonna go until about 1.15, so if you can stick around, uh, then we'll have some discussion and, and question and answers at the end of the webinar. So, um, so the white paper really starts out with an overview of the clean heating and cooling technologies that are available for uh, commercial facilities or, or in this case municipal facilities. Um, so I'll, I'll run through each of the four technologies that we really cover in depth in the white paper. The first is air source heat pumps. Um, and these are, are not, a, they're not a new technology, but they're becoming increasingly prevalent here in the Northeast. Um, they come in ductless mini split versions. Those are uh, what's pictured. Uh, ducted systems and uh, re variable refrigerant flow systems, those are uh, good in applications for larger buildings, particularly because they allow uh, for multiple zones and, uh, and real control of, of uh, what the temperature is and, and the conditioning of spaces on different floors and, and in larger structures. Um, air source heat pumps can provide heating, cooling, and or hot water. Um, so they're air source heat pump, hot water heaters, as well as space heating and cooling. Um, and they, they basically work by efficiently moving heat energy from outside to inside um, or vice versa. They can uh, reverse the flow of, of energy and, and refrigerant and uh, switch from heating to cooling mode. Um, and they do that about three to four times more efficiently using electricity than, say, your uh, standard electric resistance heating system. So they're very efficient, um, and that's why they're, they're becoming an increasingly popular and cost-effective option. Um, and some opportunities for municipalities in Massachusetts, one is that the cold climate technology for air source heat pumps is, is improving all the time and, and is significantly uh, improved in recent years, uh, making them a, a much more viable option. They're, they're everywhere in the southern United States, but uh, really in the last five or ten years, uh, the technology has, has advanced to allow them to be a really uh, a good option in the Northeast. Um, and they can be particularly cost effective when replacing fuel oil. So if you have an old fuel oil burner or you know, boiler or furnace in your, a school or a town hall, uh, these can be a really good option for supplementing the heat or, or potentially replacing those old systems altogether. Uh, the second technology that we cover is geothermal or, or ground source heat pumps. Um, and these, these work similarly except they're using uh, the, 
the warmth or uh, the, the relative difference in temperature between the air outside and the ground, which maintains a pretty standard uh, temperature of about 50 degrees, um, six feet down. So in the summertime, you can use that to dump heat into the, into the ground, and in the wintertime, you can use it to, uh, to extract heat from the earth. Um, and these can also provide heating, cooling, or hot water. Um, and with geothermal systems, uh, the upfront cost of installation is often relatively high because they involve trenching and, and digging up the ground, uh, but the operating costs over time are relatively low. Um, so they can be a really good uh, option if you're building a new building for new construction. Um, and there's pretty favorable geology in many parts of Massachusetts. Um, if you try to do geothermal on the coast of Maine, for example, there's a lot of ledge, which can make them difficult, but um, most areas of, of the, our state uh, are, are favorable in terms of the, the ground conditions for geothermal. The third technology that we cover is solar hot water. Um, so solar thermal systems can provide heating or hot water. You usually see them uh, used for domestic hot water for um, you know, uh, sinks and showers and, and washing dishes. Um, and they use solar energy to heat uh, water or refrigerant that then is used to heat water. Um, these systems are particularly good for uh, larger facilities that have a, a pretty reliable hot water load in them, um, and they can provide up to 80% of the, of the total building hot water needs that then can be supplemented by other systems. Um, and there are rebates available from the Mass Clean Energy Center, which Meg Howard, our, our panelist, will discuss later, uh, specifically for solar hot water systems. Uh, the last technology that we cover in the white paper is uh, biomass thermal systems, uh, often using pellets or wood chips, um, and these can also provide heating uh, and or hot water. They, they don't cool. Um, and they use, yeah, wood or biomass, other biomass. Um, and, and one concern with them is that these are still combustion systems, so if you're looking to um, to install entirely carbon neutral uh, systems, at least at the source. Um, these are still emitting some, uh, some greenhouse gases, uh, although relatively less. And um, there, the, the system pictured here, uh, which is also featured in the white paper, uh, is in Northfield, uh, Massachusetts. And I think they, one of the reasons they picked it is that they could get uh, locally produced uh, and delivered pellets um, so that they were supporting the local economy there. Um, so one of the other things that we highlight in the white paper is the opportunities available to municipalities. Uh, one of those is reducing overall energy use. Clean heating and cooling systems tend to be um, much more uh, energy efficient and, and use efficient, uh, energy more efficiently than standard systems. Uh, particularly if you have older, uh, older systems in your, in your buildings. Um, so, uh, as a, you know, the example that I gave of heat pumps using electricity three to four times more efficiently than uh, electric resistance, um, this is a good way to reduce your energy use overall, particularly if you're a green community and you have a 20% energy reduction goal. Um, they can also help you reduce your energy costs. Um, as I mentioned, particularly if you have facilities that are uh, using fuel oil, uh, clean heating and cooling systems can be very cost effective as a replacement for those. Um, they can increase comfort. So one of the things that, is, that people really like about many of these systems is that they, um, they work better than some of the old centralized, you know, steam boilers that make people way too hot when they don't want to be too hot and, and way too cold when they, when they don't want to be cold. So um, these uh, systems are, are advancing so that they're much more, um, much more uh, sort of can be altered and, and uh, tweaked to, to increase comfort for building occupants. 
Um, another opportunity is really to, to lead by example and to, um, to show that your municipality is, is, is thinking towards the future and, um, and to really demonstrate that the clean energy transition is possible to your residents. And I think that's one of the reasons that we're seeing a lot of municipalities consider these systems and, and install them. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the, the clean, enter, uh, clean heating and cooling can also be a driver of economic growth. Um, the Mass Clean Energy Center uh, released a report on the clean energy industry that shows that um, the industry grew by 84% between 2010 and 2018, and um, clean energy jobs are really becoming a driver of, the, of local economies around the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and then, as, as Tammy alluded to uh, in her introduction, um, these systems can also really help with climate mitigation, but also preparedness. And, um, and so they, they can really, uh, for example, more communities are starting to think about the value of cooling centers and the heat waves that we've been seeing in, uh, more of in recent years, um, so can help get ready for, for those kinds of events. Um, so, another topic that the white paper covers is the, uh, the challenges that municipalities might face if they're uh, looking at installing these systems. Uh, one could be the high upfront costs, um, and it offers a few solutions to those, including building that into plans for renovations or working through an energy services company or an ESCO. Um, and then we also recognize that many uh, municipalities around the state have limited uh, staff capacity or expertise uh, in these kinds of topics. And um, so we offer some solutions to that challenge as well as, as, well as some, some other challenges that we cover. Um, we also included a sample procurement process in the white paper just to give you a sense of what it, what it looks like to, uh, to purchase these systems at the municipality, um, and then uh, a checklist for municipalities that are considering installing these systems in their own buildings. Um, and I won't run through all of that there, but if you're, if you're curious, that's another tool that is available in the white paper. So um, the, the last piece, that I'll mention, and then I'll turn it over to Bruce Ledgerwood as the, the case studies. We talked to uh, people in four different, uh, four different areas, one, one case study for each different technology that we cover in the white paper. Um, so there's a, a really interesting geothermal system at the Walpole, Walpole Public Library, the bio, biomass system in Northfield that I mentioned. Um, a case study on the solar thermal system at Worcester State University, um, and then Bruce Ledgerwood uh, from Action for Boston Community Development is going to turn it um, is going to give us a deep dive into the air source heat pump case study here in just a little bit. So um, while we are turning over presenter privileges to Bruce, I'll just say that if you have questions at any point throughout the webinar please submit those through the Q&A box through WebEx. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll, we're hoping to have about 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to, uh, for questions and answers and a little bit of discussion then. So, Bruce, if you're ready, looks like your slides are coming up. Um, you can take it away. Okay, thank, thanks a lot, Brooks. It was a great introduction. I mean, you really covered it. Um, really a broad spectrum of technologies uh, and hit on the key points. So thank you very much for that. Um, my name is Bruce Ledgerwood. Uh, I'm actually trying to scroll down and it's not, oh, there we go. My name is Bruce Ledgerwood. Uh, I work for Action for Boston Community Development, which is a community action program that delivers fuel assistance and uh, energy efficiency programs. Uh, to uh, the greater Boston area. Uh, for the last 13 years, I've been working on renewable energy and advanced energy efficiency technologies and trying to uh, uh, implement them in the low income program. Prior to that, I have about uh, 40 years total working in the energy efficiency field. So 
Uh, I have a lot of experience in, in this area. Um, uh, Brooks, I see uh, there's something on the upper right-hand corner that's blocking part of the text. I don't know whether you can take that off from that. In any case, um, for the last four years, we've been installing air source heat pumps, primarily in public housing authority facilities, um, most of them garden style apartments, but also a few family uh, units. So most of them have been many splits, a few multi zones and one VRF system in a large multifamily building in Cambridge. We took out, we replaced Uh, we replaced electric baseboard heating in all of these units, so we don't have experience replacing natural gas systems or oil systems so much, but we do have a lot of experience replacing uh, electric baseboard heating. I'm going to flash through, I'm going to rush through a bunch of views uh, so you can see how the uh, equipment looks on the buildings. These are the outside condensers that Brooks uh, described. They capture the heat in the air and condense it and pump it up through lines to inside distribu distribution. Um, heads that look like this. Um, these mount high on the wall. There are also some that mount in the ceilings and some that mount like uh, radiators on the floor. So this isn't the only kind you can uh, acquire but this is the one that we most uh, um, often used. Here's a phase of construction. You can see the condenser going in here. They're running the refrigerant lines up through these uh, holders here, which go in through the walls and then to the, to the heads. Sometimes the condensers are mounted right on uh, small patios or decks outside the uh, apartments. By the way, we make sure that all of these uh, window air conditioners are removed after we've installed the, uh, the new air source heat pumps. Again, outside, mainly uh, installed on the rear of the buildings whenever we can, because aesthetically it's uh, more pleasing that way. Um, this is an aberration, an old school in Warren, where we had to install them um, in this fashion. The only saving grace is that this is the rear parking lot, so three quarters of the uh, of the uh, uh, building uh, is uh, uh, spared from this this view. And by the way, the tenants love these systems at that facility. Um, Here's many splits again, hung on the wall, hung on the wall, hung on the wall, Marlboro. This is a VRF system, and this is used in larger, uh, more complex uh, apartment buildings. And this system is um, it's more complex. Uh, you just have one outside condenser. It's very large um, compared to these small units for these one bedroom apartments. This is serves 23 apartment buildings, and this is the only condenser. And then inside you have these heads. Um, here is one of the technicians. Um, he's cleaning the, the filter, uh, showing the maintenance people at Cambridge Housing Authority how to maintain the, the, uh, the heads. So this is a picture of a mini split condenser with a hat on it to shed water to make sure that water doesn't uh, settle on the top of the condenser during or snow and freeze and uh, restrict the flow of air into the uh, through the condenser. Um, we require these in all the installations also. So, what benefits, what savings do accrue from these installations? We looked at. Um, we looked at uh, five major projects uh, after the units were installed. And I apologize for 
I don't know how we can get rid of this. Uh, in any case, it's there. But before the usage ran more or less like this, and after we installed in 2000, the fall of 2016 in Acton, uh, the usage went down by about 25 to 30% overall. And on the heating system, it actually went down by about 50%. I'll show you a summary of that for all five of these projects I'm about ready to show you. But I wanted to show you an independent uh, um, view of the savings that accrued from these installations. This is in um, Orleans. Again, the savings, uh, the actual usage was up around here before. And then as soon as the installations went in, 2000, fall of 2016, um, it dropped dramatically. This is in Marlborough, and you can't really see it here, but usage before, and then we did 30 of the 60 units, and the usage dropped pretty dramatically. The following year, we did the other 30 units, and it dropped all the way down to here. Providence Courts in Pittsfield, usage was up here. And then after the air source heat pumps were installed, it dropped all, all the way down to here. Um, this is the Cambridge uh, uh, large system. Usage is up around here prior to the installation. Then it dropped all the way down to here. The summary of these savings are that overall on the electric bill, it dropped around an average of 26%. You can see it varies a bit by project. Uh, but the heating system savings dropped an average of 50%. And in addition, which is something we didn't really uh, plan for, but we saw a somewhat reduced impact on the demand charges for uh, everyone but Cambridge, every project except Cambridge. And during the winter, the demand charges went down for all five projects, and there were considerable financial savings from, from this also. So what did these installations cost? Uh, we've done, we at the ABCD have done around 900 uh, apartments at this point, and National Grid's done another 1,000. Uh, so we have considerable data on how much the, these uh, installations cost. And they vary very much by, uh, we should, very much by size. I'll just tell you the mini, the small, smallest mini split costs about 4,000. Uh, the next size larger mini split costs around 5,000. The largest mini split that we were installing, the average cost around 6,000. Um, Two-headed uh, multi-zone around 7,000. Uh, a three-head multi-zone around 10,000 per house. And a uh, large multi-zone with four heads around 18,000. Uh, and that variable refrigerant flow system in Cambridge, it costs uh, for 23 heads, cost around $208,000. We don't have that much experience, but we know by bids that we received that uh, basically these VRF systems cost twice as much as the many splits and the multi zones. So that's a bit restrictive. As far as cost benefit, um, in Pittsfield, as an example, we saved, as I'll just tell you what the number is like, something like 215,000 kilowatt hours a year. Um, the simple payback on that versus the cost, the cost of the system, oh boy. Bruce, we can we can see your slides just fine. So if they're here for you. Oh, well, I can't uh, see it. So <laughs> can, can you remove that MR? I, we're not, yeah, is there a minimize button that you can click? Uh, 
It's just a little window uh, that popped up go. on your screen. I apologize for that. Okay. So <laughs> the, the, in Pittsfield, the uh, kilowatt hours, annual savings around 50000 a year. Um, and multiply it that times the cost of electricity for in the, for the lifetime of the equipment. It's amounts to around fifty one hundred fifty two thousand dollars, and the cost of that project was just about eighty thousand. So the simple payback is around nine years, a little more than nine years. The cost of electricity is going up, so the payback has actually come down a little bit. Um, in Orleans. Uh, much bigger project is around 100 units of apartments there. Kilowatt hours saved around over 200,000 annually. Multiply that times the 18 years that amounts to amounts to around $700,000 in electricity savings. And remember, there's a sizable savings on demand charges also. So this is the the 700,000 in electricity savings. Uh, you need to add to that the demand uh, savings also. Simple payback around 12 years. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I believe we're going to have Q&A at the, at the end of the, all the presentations. So I'll look forward to your questions. Great, thank you, Bruce. That was that was excellent. A really great summary, and those uh, those projects are really impressive. So um, yeah, I will do questions at the end, um, and in the meantime, uh, I will now turn it over to Shante Davidson from Eversource, who's going to talk about the um, Mass Save uh, Incentive Program for Commercial and Industrial HVAC and Heat Pump. Systems. So, um, Shante, I'm just going to pull up your slides here really quickly, but um, you can, we'll unmute you and you can uh, start taking it away. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Brooks. Really appreciate the opportunity to present on our program today. And um, we really hope that a lot of people that are on this call would consider participating in our programs. My name is Shante Davidson. I've been with Eversource for almost four years. For about the last year, I've been working um, on our um, heat pump market. And so today what I'm gonna to talk to you about is one of the programs that we have that helps us really um, key in on our mass market participants. We happen to um, use a third party program implementer to manage the nuts and bolts in the day-to-day -day of the program um, called Energy Solutions but all of the respective electric PAs that reside in the state of Massachusetts are responsible to deliver the portfolio savings and to be able to provide our customers with um, the savings as well as the equipment choice that they need to make the best heating, and, <clears throat> excuse me, to make the best heating and cooling product selections that you need for your homes. So today what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about um, what the program is, we'll dive deep into how you can participate and what that participation process looks like. And we'll also discuss some program considerations. Can you please turn the page, Brooks? Thank you, awesome. So if you, if, if any of you ever look at the, the, just one slide back, if any of you ever pay really close attention to the, the last page of your electric bill, you notice that there's a charge, it literally says energy efficiency charge, and it's quite expensive. I live in a single family home, it's just 700 square feet and it's $6.39 a month. So I would implore all of you to pay attention to your bills and to actually participate in our programs because whether or not you participate, you are being charged to help us um, create a more efficient economy. Next please, please. Awesome. So the initiative goal really focuses on two things. It focuses on adoption and access. So we're trying to work with initiative partners, specifically distributors, often referred to as supply houses. You probably see them when you're driving on the highway or on your local roads. Some of them include the likes of SG Taurus, Bell Simons, or Holmans. So what we're doing is we are providing these distributors with a pot of money that they can use to buy down the cost of these products directly at point of sale. Some of you in the past from a residential standpoint may have participated in our program. And in residential participation, it's likely that you would complete a physical application, mail it in, 
have that rebate processed and actually get the money on the back end, let's say four to six weeks later. Well, with this program, we actually activate the supply chain, most specifically these distributors, and we provide them with the incentive up front so that the contractor or you, whoever's purchasing on your behalf, verbally provides the customer details, your name, your address, your expected installation date, the model number, and the incentive that we've passed on to you. And the goal of this really is to activate that supply chain. So by doing this, our manufacturers are committed to stocking these products in the local environment. Our distributors are dedicated to sell this when a contractor or uh, a homeowner comes in the house, comes into the supply house to request this product. And it really provides the product placement that we need for consumers like you to make the best decision when it comes to your heating and your cooling needs. You'll see along the bottom that there's a couple of images, and it's really just demonstrating the fact that we use this supply chain to actually get the product to our customers that, w that might otherwise not know about the program or might not otherwise use the program. Next slide, please. So just to dive into the process a little bit further, let's say you walk into Holman's, there's a lot, there's, or, or FWF, for example, and you or your contractor ask for a standard heating unit. Instead, what would happen is the wholesaler would try to upsell you on the benefits of going with a heat pump and provide you with that incentive. So you would have um, a lesser invoice cost once you actually provided them with, with your money. The wholesaler then is going to verbally gather all that information from you. They're going to upload it to our systems. And it's a seamless process for you. You never know what happens. You basically have that interaction, grab your material, take it to your house, your, your contractor installs it, or to your business rather, your contractor installs it, and then you don't have to worry about completing any paperwork, but you've been able to make that better product selection and to get a discount directly at point of sale. Now the wholesaler also um, receives um, some, some compensation for this, so they, they are um, receiving money to help them both stock this product as well as to provide us with the, the data that you're providing them during that verbal interaction because it is administratively burdensome. But for all intents and purposes, your contractor would, would walk into that supply house. They would ask for a piece of equipment. The distributor's role is to provide you with the best piece of equipment to um, utilize that point of purchase incentive, deduct that off of your rebate, you pay that, deduct that off of your invoice, you pay that, you take your, your product and you have your install, and, um, install it and you're none the wiser. So that's pretty much what happens. Alrighty, so who is eligible? Anyone in the state of Massachusetts is eligible? Is eligible. Um, like I said, any, everybody all, all pays into this fund. And I know they, we usually get a lot of questions about municipalities, but rest assured, um, you have had a lot of municipalities um, participate and you are absolutely eligible. The next few slides are um, just jumping into the type of equipment that we have on the program. So we have air and water cooled, ductless mini and mini split systems, VRFs, dual enthalpy economizers, and ECM circulator pumps. And the next couple of pages are just snapshots of what the uh, qualified product list looks like. Um, and you, with, whenever you or your contractor are working with the, the di distributor, they're going to make sure that the product meets certain um, heating and cooling guidelines, um, which map back to um, their effectiveness. One thing that we try to do to make sure that um, it's going to happen to the program considerations. Next page again. Yeah, and then one more. Thank you so much. Um, we want to make sure that we're servicing our customers the right way um, at Eversource specifically and, and at MassSave as, as a gen, uh, in general. We have lots of pathways that consumers can access um, to capture our incentives. So to ensure that the most appropriate mass market style customer is going through this program, we do have a cap of five or more condenser units or $8,000 total incentive. And so you would just have to um, email us um, to see if it's in another program channel. If it's not in the program channel, we can accept it upstream. If it is in the program channel, then we're gonna um, process the incentive through whatever program channel it first came through. Next slide, please. 
Alrighty, and we do try to make sure that all these products um, are installed in a timely fashion and that they're installed and working properly. So we do sample um, up to 10% of the products that are sold through the program. And so it's really important that when you're out there with your um, distributor or your contractor is that they're providing the correct installation address, customer contact, as well as installation date so that when we have one of our verification auditors go out to the premises to make sure that the, that the equipment is working and working properly, that we have the correct information. And then <clears throat> finally, just want to let you know that uh, assuming you do take advantage of this um, program, all of the eligible equipment has to be on a commercial meter because that's the fund that is essentially funding um, this incentive. At least 50% of the incentive is used towards the credit, uh, the point of sale discount. So for example, earlier, if you looked at the side closely, you would have noticed that there were $75 per ton, uh, depending on the steering HSPF of a mini split. Um, I apologize for the jargon. Um, and that just means the distributor would keep half and the contractor would keep half with the thought that the contractor would pass that on to the respective customer. Um, and finally, which we, we, we talked about a moment ago, <clears throat> double dipping is not allowed. So if you have a project that you're working through a different delivery path to the utility, we would not be able to process it through this upstream program that we have through um, our, our distribution partners. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, but again, we, we really do, um, we're committed uh, to creating a, a better heating and cooling economy. We have really robust um, program and program support, and we hope that you would take advantage of our programs in the near future, or at least consider it. If you have any questions, I'll be sticking around later. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Shante. That was a great summary of, of the Mass Save programs for uh, municipal facilities and, and other commercial and industrial buildings. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Paul Ormond from the Department of Energy Resources, who's going to take us through a brief uh, overview of the Alternative Portfolio Standard Program, uh, which is another sort of funding stream that municipalities can access if they're installing clean heating and cooling systems. So take it away, Paul. Hey, thank you. I don't have a slide presentation, so um, we'll just hear me speak, I guess. Um, my name is Paul Armand. I'm from the Department of Energy Resources. We're the State Energy Office. And uh, you're probably familiar with um, RECs, Renewable Energy Credits. So when you install a solar panel, um, you generate electric power, you generate kilowatts, and you can sell the attributes of generating that um, kilowatt um, in something called a Renewable Energy Credit or an SREC, or maybe you've heard those terms. So those are just attributes for generating a, uh, a kilowatt from a solar panel. And those programs have been around for over 10 years uh, now um, for solar PV. And the state uh, a few years back was interested in having a similar REC for generating a renewable BTU. So as Bruce very well explained, uh, for example, when you install an air source heat pump, the BTU that you're, uh, that you're using to heat your, uh, your space actually comes from the outside. Uh, and you have an almost three to one uh, or an over three to one efficiency in, uh, in the work it takes to bring the BTU from the outside to the inside. So that's the state, uh, we consider that a renewable um, resource. So a few years back, the state set up a system called um, alternative, alternative Energy Credits. We, we say AICS, as an AEC, AICS. Um, and that's a parallel program to um, something that, again, like the PV uh, Renewable Energy Credit. So um, in short, uh, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, um, anything that takes BTUs from the natural environment and puts it into um, space heating um, is eligible for uh, this kind of credit. So the best way to um, explain how this program works is just to get to the punchline and give examples of what the value of this is for a typical type of project. But before I do that, I just want to um, have one more thought about all this. Um, the reason that the state uh, the, of Commonwealth of Massachusetts pushed all this out is because the state is looking to achieve um, much lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions across our whole economy. 
That was passed uh, legislatively with the Global Warming Solutions Act. And what that means is that the state's working to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions in buildings. And when you do the science, what you quickly figure out is that it makes sense to electrify buildings as much as possible um, using efficient electric ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps. Um, so um, right now, if you build a new building or you have an existing building and you're considering different ways to heat your building, the choices are fuels, which includes natural gas, uh, propane, fuel oil, um, or you could also do um, electric resistance, okay? So those are, those are in one column. And the other choice would be um, with heat pumps, um, air source and ground source heat pumps. Like Bruce explained, it's different than electric resistance. It's taking the BTU from the outside, putting it on the inside. So those are your two choices, right? Um, so if, you're, uh, if you go back and you figure out the greenhouse gas emissions for those things, what you quickly find, and everyone sort of understands that um, uh, the emissions of oil, propane, and electric resistance is not good. Um, and uh, in general, people have moved and migrated towards natural gas uh, as a seemingly good emissions play. Um, but I'm here to tell you that um, um, in the state of Massachusetts, because of our um, distributed uh, renewables that we are, have so much extensively in our state, all the solar and wind and hydro and all those things that are online and coming online, our grid electricity is actually quite good in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And so in the state of Massachusetts, um, a ground source heat pump or an air source heat pump is going to be much lower emissions than even natural gas. And this is something that we, uh, this is a, there's a misperception about this that we come across all the time. But uh, so even just recently I've heard someone ask the question, when will the greenhouse gas emissions, um, the grid emissions in Massachusetts be low enough that a heat pump will, be, will beat natural gas? I actually heard that from an experienced uh, energy consultant in the state of Massachusetts. And the answer is it's already lower. <laughs> so, so don't let any consultant uh, tell you otherwise. Uh, that may be the case in Illinois or Colorado, uh, but that's not the case in Massachusetts. Um, so right now in the year 2020, if you go to an air source heat pump for space heating versus natural gas, your emissions are 45% lower. So it, it beats the pants off natural gas. And it really beats the pants off uh, oil and propane and electric resistance. Um, but wait, there's more. Um, because the, the grid emissions in mass is getting better and better and better. And it's not getting a little bit better. It's getting, um, it's getting you know, times big numbers better. Uh, so by 2050, um, a air source heat pump for space heating is 85% lower emissions than natural gas. And we bring up 2050 because that's when your building will still be being heated, right? So if you're building new construction now or you're renovating, you'd expect that choice of heating system to be still working in the coming decades. So it actually makes sense to look at where the grid will be as opposed to where the grid is now. Uh, so right now you're 45% better compared to natural gas, and, you're, and in the future you'll be 85% better compared to natural gas. Okay, so for all those reasons, the state uh, wants to incentivize electrification of um, space heating and moving off fossil fuels. And so that was why the, um, the alternative energy credit system was set up, again, like, like solar PV, except now we're incentivizing BGUs. Um, so there's, there's two pathways for um, getting AICs, which can be sold for, for money. Um, and one is that you get paid over time. Um, and, and the way it works out practically is that if you're looking at doing like a municipal office um, or a fire station, a uh, use of that nature, um, that's the pathway you go. And in that pathway, it's designed that um, it'll offset, the value of those eggs will actually offset and offset more than any additional cost it would be to electrify. So uh, today, if you're considering a new fire station, your choice might be natural gas or using heat pumps and also VRFs 
uh, just a kind of heat pump, by the way. So we'll say heat pumps and bureaus. Um, so if your choice is natural gas based heating or heat pump slash VRF based heating, um, if you uh, have some one of your consultants does an analysis of how much would you pay each month, it's unfortunately the case that your your natural gas based heating will still be cheaper, even though it has much higher greenhouse gas emissions. Now that's uh, that's the case before you apply alternative energy credits. So once you apply alternative energy credits, it'll reverse that extra cost and more. So you'll actually come out ahead. So I just want to make sure when you're planning your municipal building that you need to be sure that your consultant is taking into consideration the value of ACE because it will actually cost you less to operate that um, building that's space heated with heat pumps and VRF. Uh, so, so two giant myths just exploded, <laughs> all right? Myth one. Natural gas is lower emissions, not true. The opposite is true. Myth two, natural gas will be less expensive to heat, not true. Once you count aches, it's, um, it's more expensive. It'd be less expensive to heat with uh, heat pumps. Okay, but there's another really interesting wrinkle to all this, and I'm glad Bruce had his presentation first because there's another pathway for getting alternative energy credits if your building involves dwelling units. Okay, so whether that's a single family house or a townhouse or a 500 unit skyscraper, if there's dwelling units, you can go this pathway. And the, the, the pathway is that instead of being paid over time your aches, you get paid 10 years worth of aches all up front lump sum. And uh, these numbers get to be huge when you start to look at it from when you can go this pathway. So I just want to give you an example. Um, if you have a if you have a 900 square foot dwelling unit, and you use qualifying air source heat pumps, the value of the apes works out to be three dollars per square foot. So if you had a hundred units of 900 square foot dwelling units, that would be three hundred thousand dollars lump sum paid up front. That's on top of whatever you get from mass saves, things of that nature. Okay. If you uh, um, had, a, if you did the same thing with ground source heat pump, a 100 unit apartment with 900 square foot units, that would be $500,000 lump sum. Um, because we also want to um, incentivize efficiency, um, we apply multipliers that increase the incentive. If you build to hers 50 or better or passive house, so if you do either one of those two things, instead of being 300 and 500,000, for the example I explained, it's 500 and 700,000 dollars. And I think most of you may be stretch code municipalities. The stretch code, um, and this is just another giant myth that we come across all the time. If you build dwelling units in a stretch code town, they have to be built to HERS 55. That's code minimum in a stretch code town. So if someone is proposing to build um, in your stretch code town an apartment building, maybe it's you know for senior living or you know I, municipalities. I'm trying to think of examples that municipalities get involved in um, senior living or um, uh, public housing and things of that nature. Um, uh, the, 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 the building out of the box needs to be HERS 55. That's a minimum code. And if so, if a developer is building the code and they're putting that gas on that, that's like leaving money on the table. They will not qualify for up to $700,000. If they just made that HERS 50 and electrify, replace that gas with uh, air source and or ground source, they'll be eligible for hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is, and there's almost no difference going from HERS 55 to 50. It's, it's just a, a minor difference. Um, so there is one more um, interesting wrinkle to all this, and that is um, uh, building to passive house standards. Because there's now a new mass save incentive for passive house dwelling units 
Um, so if you go back to that 100 unit um, apartment I was describing, if you add the mass, mass save um, passive house incentives with the alternative energy credits, in that example I just gave to you uh, for the 100 unit apartments, um, if I do that with, um, with air source, that works out to over $8,000 per dwelling unit. Um, that would be $800,000 total for a 100 unit building. If it was ground source, it's over 10,000 per dwelling unit. That's over a million dollars of incentives paid lump sum to the developer. So developer proposing um, uh, 100 units of um, senior living or public housing, uh, they better, they should sharpen their pencil and see if they shouldn't actually do that with passive house. Otherwise they're leaving a million dollars on the table. Um, so uh, just a few final thoughts. Um, these credits are, you're eligible for these credits whether you're a municipality, a nonprofit, a profit, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just like renewable energy credits from um, PV, it doesn't matter who you are. You don't have to be a stretch code city. You don't have to be anything. You just have to qualify with the right equipment um, and you can get these. So your tax incentive, your tax structure doesn't matter, um, things of that nature. Uh, this is also, uh, I've talked a lot about new construction, but this also, all the same information applies for existing construction uh, if you're doing a renovation. Thank you. Actually, before we move on to Meg Howard, Paul, if you don't mind, I just have two clarifying questions. Um, one, and you mentioned how you can get a bunch of the eggs up front. Um, am I correct in understanding that for the smaller size equipment that could be installed at, say, a smaller public facility municipal building, that there's a way, and I forget if it's pre-minting or forward minting, that some of that, some of those eggs could also be up front, which could help um, offset mm -hmm. that initial cost. Yeah. If you had a small facility, like a, if you had a, a police station or a small municipal building, you're, um, especially if you build to high efficiency, the size of the HVAC system might actually qualify for the small paid up front thing um, as opposed to being paid up over time. So that's possible. Great. Thank you. And my, my second clarifying question was just in terms of other technologies that are also eligible for AIGS. You mostly spoke about air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps. I believe solar thermal and biomass thermal are also yes. eligible for it. Yeah, so, yeah I'm, I'm not so familiar with those personally, but there's also in the mix there. And uh, we are also working on um, expanding the AIC eligibility for, um, for hot water heating that is done with um, air source or ground source. Great. But that's probably a year out. All right. Hot off the presses. Hot off the presses. <laughs> Look out for that. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. Yep. Thank you. Great. So um, last but certainly not least, we have uh, Meg Howard from the Mass Clean Energy Center. And thank you, Paul, for uh, engaging a little myth busting with us. Um, yep. Um, Meg is going to take us quickly through the Mass Clean Energy Center's solar hot water program. So. Um, Take it away, Meg. I'll advance the slides, but you're unmuted, so whenever you're ready. Thanks. Uh, if you want to go on to the next slide, uh, before I jump into our solar hot water incentives that we currently have, I just wanted to give a little bit of background um, because MassEC has supported all these technologies that we've been talking about today. Solar hot water was our earliest in 2011, um, but we started supporting uh, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, and uh, biomass, modern wood heating uh, in 2013, and just some stats on the slide about, you know, supporting over 20,000 projects. Um, we have now phased out our commercial project um, incentive programs that would apply to municipalities for everything besides solar hot water uh, as of this year due to, to our own funding and budget constraints. Um, and our, our hope is that a lot of the incentive programs that Shantae talked about will kind of, uh, and Paul talked about, um, will we'll start to um, play the, the same role that our incentives had been playing. But I just wanted to mention that we have done this work. Um, so if you're interested, uh, we'd be happy to be a resource on any of these technologies. Um, if you want to see what installers have done, projects through us, cost data through our programs, we're always happy to um, serve as a resource. So please feel free to reach out. 
Um, the solar hot water incentives that we currently are offering are going to go at least through 2020, the end of 2020. Um, so if you'll go on to the next slide, uh, I just wanted to start, you know, we've talked some about solar hot water, but just do a, a little bit more on what we think makes a good site. Um, basically high hot water usage throughout the year, um, and that's just because the hot water in those buildings is, is a high enough expense to kind of justify um, an uh, investment like this. Um, and uh, as with any clean heating and cooling technology, the payback is going to be the strongest against oil, propane, and electric water heating. Um, although supporting Paul's myth-busting attitude, solar hot water, um, you know, as a renewable resource, is certainly cheaper to operate than any fuel, including natural gas. Um, so some other screening questions you might ask once you, you, you know a facility does have high hot water usage throughout the year, you might um, think about if there's roof space or ground space where, where these collectors could be mounted. Do you have a sense the roof's in pretty good condition? Um, and then also thinking about where you might put a storage tank. So depending on the size of the system, uh, this might be anywhere just from kind of a residentially sized um, tank that would go in your basement to something a little bit larger if it's, if it's a bigger facility. Um, but just want to think about if there's room in a mechanical room or basement to um, squeeze in a storage tank. Uh, so some examples that you might think of uh, in municipally owned buildings, um, commu definitely community centers, especially anything with an indoor pool um, or even an outdoor pool, but indoor pool has that year-round usage. Uh, are great applications for solar hot water. If the municipality owns any uh, multifamily housing, something like fire stations where you have people who um, are showering there um, can also be great. Anything with a kitchen, uh, this picture on the bottom right actually was, um, uh, it's owned by the, the Franklin County, County Community Development Corporation, but it, the solar hot water was to serve their uh, food processing center that they have. So there's a couple uh, small businesses that, that make food products located here, and the solar hot water collectors were, were serving their needs uh, in the kitchen. So anywhere you've got you know lots of dishes and processed water. Um, so other examples um, you know that I didn't think would necessarily be municipally owned, but just to kind of put on your radar in case they are, or in case you know of projects in your town. Um, any hotels, motels, again, where you have that high uh, laundry usage, you know, laundry mat specifically, breweries, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, dairy farms, and colleges and universities are all other examples to add to this list. Going on to the next slide, um, Mass CEC is offering uh, up to $5,000 for feasibility studies, and that's only eligible for project sites owned uh, by a government, nonprofit, agricultural, or affordable housing entity. Um, but certainly, any municipally owned building would be eligible to have $5,000 towards a um, solar hot water feasibility study, which should generally cover um, uh, about 95% of the cost. You know, we do require a 5% cost share from the owner, so it needs to be some way to figure out uh, how to, to put in a small amount of money. Um, but we've, we've seen uh, quotes from these solar thermal feasibility consultants right around $5,000. Um, one caveat to this is that we put a little more screening if it's a natural gas facility, just because the payback is less strong. Um, we want to uh, ascertain up front that, that you, the system owner, are comfortable with a bit of a longer payback before we dive into the feasibility study. Uh, so if you have a facility that you think you're interested in looking into solar hot water, this is a great, great way to do it. Going on to the next slide. Uh, and then just a little bit about our incentive. If you actually decide to move forward with construction, um, our incentive is based on the number of collectors and the efficiency, but it can work out to be up to 50% of project costs for public entities, um, a little bit less for for-profit entities and more for affordable housing uh, projects specifically and that total can be up to $100,000. We do require a feasibility study for any system that's going to be greater than eight panels, but uh, we do have the funding for that, like I mentioned on the previous slide. So it's a rolling deadline, uh, at least through the end of 2020, is currently authorized. Um, you know, next step would recommend is reaching out to an installer. We have lists of installers on our website. Um, if you want to talk to me or anyone else at MassCEC, 
first. I'm always happy to chat, um, and I'm sure MAPC feels the same way. I know they've worked with us uh, on a lot of solar hot water stuff specifically, so I think the team there uh, is also a great resource for that. Uh, and that's it. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Meg. That was a great, uh, succinct overview of, of MassDEC's program. So um, we now have about five minutes for uh, question and answer. So um, again, I, we have a few, uh, few questions lined up, but if you have any other ones that you want to submit, you can do that in the Q&A section in the WebEx window. Um, quick question for you, Bruce. We're going to uh, unmute all of our uh, panelists now, but um, Bruce, do you have any data about greenhouse gas savings from the projects that you presented? Yeah, not at our my fingertips, but uh, we have done some calculations, but I, I just don't have it to provide today. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll. Uh, we, we'll we looked at that, those. and it, we looked at that in particular when we were considering doing um, single-family homes and what the uh, impacts would be. But uh, again. Uh, I don't okay. have it today. Great. Um, there was also a question. Uh, yeah, I, I believe we, we will be posting the slides and a recording of this webinar. Um, the, the webinar has been recorded, so we'll be putting those up on our, on our website. Um, so had a question about um, aches for you, Paul. Um, do you know how many non-residential aches have been issued uh, and the question was specifically in, in relation to a, like a large firehouse, maybe 30 tons worth of, of cooling? Yeah, I'm not, I don't know the, uh, the number that have been issued, not, uh, residential, non-residential. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, then we had another question. Um, so uh, this is, again, for you, Bruce. There were two housing authorities that had increased usage in the summer. Um, do you know if those uh, those communities, those those buildings, had air conditioning before the um, heat pump systems went in? Um, all of them, all of the five projects we saw there had extensive uh, window air conditioning. Uh, what we think goes on <laughs> has gone on is that people have very comfortable, uh, easy to use air conditioning. Uh, after these air source heat pumps are installed, and, and uh, uh, so they make use of it. Um, yeah. There also may have been a weather factor there, so I, uh, I'm not sure which ones uh, you're referring to, but uh, we have generally seen not an increase in the family and the elderly housing authorities that we've where we've installed this equipment. We've done some small family homes small homes with families in them, and we have seen an increase there in air conditioning, and it's significant. Great. And just as a follow-up, do you think or have you guys deployed any sort of education to the, the residents as well to kind of help them understand how, even though it might be easier to kind of use more air conditioning, that, that there are ways to have savings to their electricity bills if they're a little bit more um, careful with that use? Yes, uh, we we haven't really had the resources to be able to follow up in that way, but we've right. noted it and we, in current or future installations, we're advising customers to about this issue. That's great. Um, great. So a couple more questions and then we'll, I think we'll wrap up in the next minute or so. Um, one is about um, PPAs in new construction and um, how that would work, you know, would the municipality build the shell, the, the structure of the building and would they maybe do a PPA or a sort of an ESCO agreement with, uh, with a third party company and as far as I know, I think that would work. The municipality would just build build the building, and then the um, the system would either be entirely owned by a third party, which some some companies will do, or um, would be sort of installed on a on a PPA type basis. Um, any other panelists want to weigh in on that front? Uh, 
I'll just point folks to, again, to the white paper. We do discuss yep. this a little bit in there. Um, Brooks is correct that there's a couple of different ways to go about it, and through a, having bringing in a third party uh, to own uh, the, the technology or the equipment and then um, work with the municipality on kind of taking care of the maintenance and the other options like that, too. Um, there, there's the ability then for that third party, which would be a taxable entity, to take advantage of sometimes federal or other tax incentives as well. So there's some savings that can come from that. As well as there being, as there is in a PPA with a solar project, the advantages of having the maintenance and the operations and things like that taken care of. Um, so there's the different kind of variations out there. We haven't seen it as much. Um, at least in our experience here at MAPC, for HVAC equipment, as we have seen it for solar installations, um, at least on the PPA or that type of model side, a PPA is a power purchase agreement, for those who aren't sure of that acronym. Um, but for the ESCO, the energy services company, um, that's something where you know, they are handling, at times, upgrades of, of HVAC equipment. If they go in, say, to a community and, and do a bundle of different through a performance savings contract of different energy efficiency upgrades at one or more municipal facilities. So I think there's great opportunity there and it's something that does fit into that model pretty well to incorporate you know, clean heating and cooling technologies as you're upgrading your facilities instead of just say a, a you know, more efficient gas boiler. Um, and that's something that would easily fit into the current ESCO type of contract and model that folks are, are more familiar with. Great. And uh, one, one last qu quick question that I can answer. We had a question, uh, someone asking if any municipalities have considered interconnected geothermal or water-based district energy systems uh, for public building. The answer is yes. Um, there are a number of municipalities that we know of that are starting to look at um, water-based district energy systems or um, yeah, interconnected systems for public buildings. So if you're interested in those, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, but that is something that, that uh, places elsewhere in the world, particularly in Europe, they're the leaders on, on district energy systems. But um, there's one right here in downtown Boston, um, lots of college campuses, yeah, um, that are STEAM and, and uh, maybe looking to move to water-based systems. So. Um, with that, I think... Can I just say, and too, to that, look out for um, another paper and potentially a webinar on water-based district energy systems coming up in the near future. So a plug for that. With yes, stay tuned for more. Um, so thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. Thank you to all of you <laughs> on the line for tuning in today. Um, and yeah, stay tuned for more on this front. Please feel free to uh, access the white paper on our website at the, at the link shown on the screen here, and um, thank you all for joining us. Take care.